Welcome to part two of the four-part series, Decoding Stroke. I'm inside the Burke Neurological Institute where research is taking place to reduce stroke impairment. Today, we'll learn about motor recovery. We'll also meet two therapists who are involved in clinical stroke studies. Follow me. Decoding Stroke, Part 2. What happens now? Motor recovery. The brain does not merely consist of individual areas, but also contains many networks or pathways that link brain regions together. Some of these networks lead to areas that control how we move. A stroke that damages any motor-related network can lead to upper or lower limb impairment. One important area supported by motor networks in the brain is the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex helps to control voluntary motor activity. A stroke that affects the motor cortex may impair movement and coordination of the upper or lower limbs, or in some cases, both. The primary motor cortex is located in the front portion of the brain known as the frontal lobe. It is divided into three sections that are responsible for voluntary movement. Movements on the right side of your body are controlled by the left side of your brain, and vice versa. So, a stroke on the right side of your brain, known as the right hemisphere, may cause weakness in the limbs of the left side of your body. This partial paralysis is known as hemiparesis. Other motor issues caused by stroke may include spasticity or muscle contraction. Lower limbs and upper limbs are represented in different portions of the motor cortex in the brain. The therapists who assist patients in recovering limb function often deal with upper and lower limbs separately. Physical therapists often work on balance and lower limb function. Occupational therapists often focus more on upper limb recovery and fine motor coordination. However, as we'll soon see, these therapists also work on a great deal more in helping patients with stroke recovery. Many patients experience motor recovery within the first three to six months after a stroke. However, many others experience at least some chronic motor disability. Chronic motor impairments impact at least 60% of stroke survivors who may experience difficulty with movement of the lower or upper limbs. The type of symptoms and the degree of stroke recovery will depend upon many factors, including size of stroke, its location, the severity of deficits, previous health history, the patient's age, the available resources within the community, and importantly, caregiver support. Recovery of function occurs because of the healing ability of the brain, something known as neuroplasticity. Therapists encourage patients to perform rigorous exercises to stimulate brain plasticity. We will now briefly explore the role of physical and occupational therapy in stroke motor recovery. Your physical therapist is licensed and certified in your state. Their credentials may include the Doctor of Physical Therapy Advanced Clinical Degree. Your physical therapist's goal is to promote your physical independence after a stroke. Your physical therapist will design a plan that is customized to your specific needs. This will include exercises for strength, flexibility, muscle tone, balance, coordination, gait and walking, stretching and range of motion, and in some cases, electrical stimulation, also known as e-stim. Your physical therapist is also concerned with your functional ability to return to daily activities. So he or she may work with you on how to transfer safely in and out of your bed, chair, or car and may provide you with a home exercise program to promote the carryover of your therapy gains. Cardio and pulmonary exercises may also be included in your therapy plan. Your physical therapist may also provide instruction regarding the use of external aids. These may include a walker or cane if necessary. Today, at Burke Neurological Institute and elsewhere, physical therapists often use cutting-edge technology such as robotics and exoskeletons to assist with regaining movement. 
Within three months of having a stroke, about 95% of patients recover the ability to walk to at least some degree. However, gait may deviate from normal walking patterns, and one-third of patients who recover will require at least some supervision for walking. Physical therapy focuses on two goals. First, therapy attempts to augment and enhance restitution, or recovery from the impairment itself. This relies on brain plasticity or reorganization, as well as the repair of muscle strength and motor control and coordination. The second focus of physical therapy is on compensation, which means enhancing your performance in activities of daily living. This is known as a task-based approach and may include the use of orthotic devices and external aids. Improving balance is another important part of stroke recovery that physical therapists can assist with. This is important because 40% of stroke survivors will experience a fall within just one year after a stroke. This is because stroke patients may experience reduced reflex responses, making them more vulnerable to falls and subsequent injury. Physical therapists can use traditional methods to improve balance, such as repetitive practice with leg exercises, core strengthening exercises, foot drop exercises, blindfolding while sitting or standing, and cognitive training for spatial awareness. Other methods have also been shown to be helpful in improving balance, such as yoga and the use of virtual reality training. Now let's meet a physical therapist who can tell us about newer developments in physical therapy for stroke recovery. I'm here with Amy, a physical therapist at the Burke Neurological Institute. Hi, Amy. Hi, Susan. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm curious, what changes have you seen in stroke rehabilitation as a physical therapist? I'd say the most important change that I've seen is the advent of uh, assistive technology that helps mobilize patients uh, more easily. So, for example, somebody who wouldn't otherwise be able to walk might be able to get into an assisted treadmill where they're harnessed in and the robot will do movements that the participant doesn't have, but the participant can use their own strength. Same with an exoskeleton where they're walking over ground. Um, it allows the therapist to have a much more quality session for somebody who wouldn't otherwise be walking around. Um, it, it also kind of helps with the theories of neuroplasticity, where we're just increasing repetition, specificity, and intensity during treatment. So it's been a really nice addition as a treatment option. That sounds very promising. Thanks so much, Amy. Thank you. Post-stroke spasticity of the extremities is thought to be caused by overexcitability of the stretch reflex, the normal contraction of muscle in response to passive stretching. Damage to areas of the brain following stroke can cause prolonged muscle tightness, leading to spasticity. Post-stroke spasticity affects up to one half of stroke patients and has debilitating effects, contributing to diminished activities of daily living, quality of life, pain, and functional impairments. Botulinum toxin, commonly known as Botox, has been shown to be safe for the treatment of post-stroke spasticity and is useful in reducing pain and improving patients' ability to perform activities of daily living when combined with physical or occupational therapy. An occupational therapist, or OT, is another licensed certified specialist. Today, your occupational therapist is likely to hold an advanced degree as a doctor of occupational therapy. Your occupational therapist's goal is to promote independence in activities of daily living, sometimes referred to as ADLs. Your OT will design a therapy plan that is individualized to your specific needs. This may include exercises for upper limb strength, flexibility, muscle tone, coordination, difficulty attending to one side of the body, known as left or right-sided neglect, activities of daily living, such as cooking, dressing, driving, and more. Your OT may work with you on stretching or increasing the range of motion in your upper limbs, and may provide electrical stimulation or e-stim to areas affected by upper limb weakness due to stroke. 
your OT may work closely with you to provide a home safety plan or home exercise program. Other areas covered by your occupational therapist may include exercises for hand-eye coordination, inner ear difficulties such as dizziness, and basic cognitive exercises to increase attention and memory. Did you know that your occupational therapist may also provide you with a driver evaluation to determine your readiness to resume driving? The use of tools for activities of daily living commonly required for cooking, eating, and dressing, even for opening items in your kitchen and medicine cabinet, can also be addressed by your occupational therapist. And new technologies such as robotics for upper limb improvement may also be used by your occupational therapist to assist you with stroke recovery. One important role of your occupational therapist is to assist you in the selection and proper use of adaptive tools to enhance your independence and quality of life. As with physical therapy, occupational therapy often takes the approach of reducing impairment while also training patients to negotiate daily tasks with ease during the recovery process. Here are examples of two types of adaptive tools that help patients regain independence of function while they're recovering from stroke. Now, we'll meet an occupational therapist at the Burke Neurological Institute who is using new technology to assist patients with improving upper limb impairment following stroke. I'm here with Marissa, an occupational therapist at the Burke Neurological Institute, who's going to tell us about this cutting-edge new technology to help people with stroke. Hi, Susan. So this is one of our upper limb robots. And what we do is we put individuals who have hemiparesis or upper extremity weakness from a neurological condition in this robot. And we strap them in. And what it does is it helps to unweight the upper extremity and allows them to move their arm going into different planes to get increased repetition. So in these sessions, they get close to a 1,000 repetitions in about an hour, which is something that we typically don't get to do in a traditional OT session. And with our studies, what we do is we have training protocols in which individuals come and use this a couple times a week. And then we also use it paired with different things like brain stimulation and other products to see how that impacts the upper limb training. Very exciting, thank you. The degree of motor recovery after stroke depends on the size of the stroke and the location of damaged brain tissue. The brain's ability to rewire itself, called neuroplasticity, often leads to early recovery in the first three months after stroke. Even though physical and occupational therapy can't reverse damage done by a stroke, these therapies can help stroke patients achieve an optimal outcome. Physical and occupational therapies help stroke patients relearn important skills through repetitive practice. A neurorehabilitation program is most often customized to individual patient needs. The exercises chosen by your therapist should have evidence to support their use. Muscle weakness, loss of coordination and sensation, and problems with physical activities of daily living can all be addressed through structured therapy programs. Physical and occupational therapies also address compensation for any residual deficits that remain chronic. We hope that this episode about stroke motor recovery has helped you to understand stroke a bit better. The researchers, scientists, and clinicians at the Burke Neurological Institute, an affiliate of Weill Cornell Medicine, thank you for your interest. Please join us for the rest of this series, Decoding Stroke, when next time, in Part 3, we will explore aphasia recovery. And in Part 4, we'll explore the newest developments in stroke research at BNI and elsewhere. Thanks so much for joining us today as we continue to decode stroke. Please join us for parts three and four of this four-part video series. Thanks so much again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. For a list of references regarding the material discussed in this video, please feel free to contact us at burke.weil.cornell.edu.